Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever-blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and that sometimes messy thing we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, we are back for another episode. I'm here with a brand new friend of mine, Nick Brimmer. Nick, thank you so much for making time for the Boca Podcast today. Hey, man. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. And, and I have to say, first of all, I actually feel that that tone of voice that everybody just heard is the same tone of voice you greeted me with earlier before we started recording. And it's very contagious. I was like, oh, man, this, this guy's actually excited to have conversation. So I appreciate you bringing that energy to the conversation. Uh, I'm certainly going to play off of that. But before we get into kind of our regular interview questions, you said something before we started recording, which I thought was really interesting. We were talking about the flow of conversation for this interview, and you said that you as a creative tend to follow structure or, or kind of a plan and then from that plan will deviate. And, and my response to you at the time was, well, I thought a, a creative in my mind, a creative naturally just doesn't really have a plan. They kind of do whatever comes to mind at the time. They're very in the moment. They go with the flow. They let their creativity flow. They look for inspiration and let that take them where it may. This was a little bit of a different take on a creative. And I, I'm wondering if maybe you can expound on that. Totally. That's that's such a great question. I am probably the most scattered creative I have ever met. Um, <laughs> so maybe that works for other people. Um, I just have found that it sometimes not having a plan lands me in places that they just aren't aren't helpful. So yeah, so I, I really like I have a plan and then I can deviate from that. But you know, maybe if I'm even shooting a wedding, like I will have the timeline and shots set out and then I can deviate from there. I'll let my creativity really come from a plan that I know will succeed. So that's, that's kind of, that's, I do that with everything, I guess. Well, and to be clear, I think it's a great thing. I, it just caught my attention because I'm used to conversations like that going the other way where it's again, the emphasis on just kind of going with the flow and being in the moment. And I think a good balance for somebody who is an artistic, a creative individual um, is to create, even if it's a loose structure, and this is something we've talked about a lot in the podcast, to create a loose structure within which to function that still makes room, that enables room for the sake of freedom and creativity. I mean, I'll kind of raise my hand and, and be the first person here to say that I don't like to be, to feel like I'm my time is micromanaged. I, I started, yeah. I mean, I, one of my favorite things about starting businesses, being my own boss is the freedom, the flexibility that comes with that. And so the last thing that I want is to, you know, time block every 15 minute segment of my day. I think that's ridiculous. I, I want the freedom. I want the flexibility to get work done, but then take a break and go ride a motorcycle or sit and read or whatever the thing might be. I like that freedom, that flexibility. I think the same thing applies here create a loose structure to get the things done that we know we need to, but then leave room for that creativity, leave room for that freedom and that flexibility that is such an important part of being a business owner. I think that's a great balance. Yeah. All of what you said, I agree with. And the quote that comes to mind, I can't remember who said it, but failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Mm. And I've just shown up to too many things whether it be, you know, a photo shoot or a wedding, and I'll walk away and saying, you know, I didn't necessarily get what I was hoping for or what I had envisioned. So when I come in with a vision, I can oftentimes at least get closer to that or have, I found a far greater quality of product for everything I do. So Cool. Well, I, not yeah. that there is a clear definition of balance, but a little bit of balance is not a bad thing. And it certainly doesn't have to stifle creativity. And I, I think that's important for all of us to remember. We can have both structure and creativity, structure and freedom, and mm. they can actually complement each other in wonderful ways on multiple levels. And uh, that's a yes. great way to start this conversation. Talk to me about your brand. And, and you're based in the Seattle area. Is that right? 
Yes. Yeah, so uh, Portland in Seattle now. So I'm actually home base in Portland, but okay. I serve both the Seattle and Portland market. Very, very cool. Seattle is a favorite place of mine. I have family in that area. I actually lived there for a little while. And as cliche as it might sound, it is just truly beautiful. The the evergreen nature of Seattle is stunning. And uh, I love visiting there. But in that market, in the Portland market, there are plenty of wedding photographers. And so this brings me to my first question, which is about brand position. How do you position yourself against the other photographers in your market? You may consider yourselves friends and, and a great community, and that's cool. But at the end of the day, your clients are still looking at you as individual businesses. They have to be able to differentiate. So how do you position yourself against the other photographers? What is your brand position? It's so funny that I'm on this podcast because your podcast is what a few, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago made me really think about this. So my brand position is this statement. And I say this to clients. I say it is authentic, beautiful wedding photography with exceptional service to leave you glowing about your day. And talk to me a little bit about what that means. I, I know authentic mm. is a word that we hear a lot. So there's we run the risk a little bit here of, of that mm. getting lost in the mix because people are hearing that word thrown around a lot today. What, what does that mean with regards to your photography and your brand specifically? Yeah. So the, the common scenario where I'm chatting with, let's say, prospective brides or couples is really at a, a wedding show where they're interviewing 10 photographers in one place. So you, man, talk about feeling the heat and having to present well. So as I'm explaining this authentic, I'm opening up wedding books, I'm showing images, I'm sharing stories about brides crying and grooms laughing and funny things. So they really actually truly get a sense of, wow, I just saw Jordana's wedding and I feel like I'm Jordana's friend because it's authentic to their personality. Mm. So, yes. And so. and so just to play a little devil's advocate again, uh, trying mm -hmm. to understand how that positions you against other photographers. Do you, do you feel like or do you see a lot of other photographers in your area who are not providing that type of and obviously we're not calling out any names here, to be clear. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you do you look at the general market and feel like there are a lot of photographers who are not offering that level of authenticity where you can't feel the emotion of the day? Um, gosh, there's just so, you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to play my own enemy here. I think there are so many great photographers out there, which makes my job a little more difficult. Sure. I do find that I take a, I, I mostly only shoot weddings. I grab lunch with my clients. By the time we've shot their engagement photos, we have a planning session over lunch and I deliver their engagement photos. They're excited about those. By the time they show up to, wedding they're so comfortable and i know them so well and that that's really where i key into authentic is that i know them and their personality and what they want to convey as humans and then i can bring that out in a comfortable way because we know each other so well yeah so does that answer that question well? Well, I, first of all, I understand what you mean and that you're not trying to to put yourself above any other photographers. And that's certainly not the point that I'm making here. I just wanted yeah. to, you know, the, the the conversation around brand position is not one that I hear going on in the industry very much. Mm -hmm. And while I realize the significance of individuality, right? When, when you say to somebody, yeah. hey, what, what's the difference between you and another business? A lot of times you hear photographers talk about the fact that it's them. They are the difference. And well, that works well if you if all your business comes from referrals. Uh, if you're going to do any kind of marketing, whether that's through Facebook or Instagram, or you're going to a networking meeting, and you, you don't have a whole lot of time to do anything other than to just very briefly mention your photography brand to somebody else, the question that I have here with regards to brand position is how do you differentiate yourself from the other person? If, if, you know, Sam says, Hey, I am a wedding photographer and Sarah says I'm a wedding photographer and Nick says he's a wedding photographer. Well, that doesn't differentiate. So now we have to find what the differentiator between those three things, uh, those three photographers is. And it, there are a lot of conversations these days about the significance of the individual personality. So that doesn't really create distinction unless there is time to actually get to know the person. There is a lot of conversation around relationships. There's a lot of conversations. I mean, we hear the word authentic uh, photography or authentic or genuine is another word that's used a lot. Genuine emotion um, in reference to emotion mm -hmm. and the raw feeling of the imagery. There are a lot of these words and adjectives that are used a lot of the time. And so 
that when we talk about the significance of brand position, we have to make sure that we're using words that, um, and, and then a level of service, a type of service that actually sets us apart from the photographer next door, and that we're communicating that in a way that's distinct from the photographer next door, which is why I was asking for um, a little bit more detail about the the significance of authenticity, because that is a word that's heard a lot. So if somebody hears that and they're like, hey, um, authentic, I, I get the idea of authentic, but you know, so-and-so down the street said that they take genuine, uh, they capture photographs with genuine emotion in them. So what's the difference between that and authentic? And being able to clearly and very quickly understand the difference between what you're offering and what that photographer down the street is offering is really important in a world that is very busy and very noisy and you have very little time to be able to capture that person's attention. We have to be able to effectively communicate what actually sets us apart from that other photographer, that group of photographers, if we're at a networking event, for example. So that's that's why I asked this question, and that's why I'm trying to create some awareness around the conversation in our industry. And I, I love the the significance of authenticity and certainly beautiful wedding photography. Exceptional service um, is so, so important. And and I love, and I'm actually looking at Nick's site here. By the way, for everybody listening in, if you go to nickbrimmerphotography.com, just like it sounds, of course, we'll link to this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But Nick it says, all to leave you feeling amazing about your wedding day. And, you know, at the end of the day, capturing beautiful photographs is important, but the, the lasting significance of their experience with us mm-hmm. can be summed up in a feeling. And very simply, a feeling of, um, well, a, a feeling amazing feeling where you help them feel good about themselves, you help them feel good about their day, help remind them about those incredible feelings by then delivering beautiful photographs. But it is that feeling, it's about how you make them feel, and we can do that through the experience that we create. And uh, so I love that you sum it up with that at the end. But I appreciate you giving your perspective on this, and and I don't want to spend too much time here, but I think it's really important for everybody listening in, for myself, as, as I continue to develop brands, uh, to continue to to make sure that we are communicating very clearly, very succinctly, how we differentiate ourselves from those around us so that we don't get lost in the noise of Instagram and Facebook and all the conversation going on out there. Yep, you're so right. The I think when I was crafting that statement, I can't remember who said it, but the quote was, people don't remember... People don't remember your product as much as they remember how they feel about your product. Yeah, yeah. So, and that just, that changed the way I ran my whole business. Like that brought so many layers of service to it, to the, to the couples and, and to the clients and to their families and stuff. So, yep. Yeah, for sure. And how we make them, I mean, that goes back to that conversation about experience, right? So we're creating this experience and a lot of that has to do with how we interact with them. Uh, when we talk about brand position, if if I, for example, and I'll use Photographer's Edit here as, as, as a point of reference, we say custom editing. So that's the service that we offer for the professional photographer. Now, we used to say custom editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. But what we found was that clients were coming to us or potential clients were coming to us and they were like, hey, are you do you also do commercial work or do you also do this thing or that thing and we're like well yeah actually we do we had we had been calling out wedding and portrait photographers specifically because that was the majority of our target market but we broadened that just a little bit to say professional photographer the emphasis is on custom editing because other companies in our market are offering for example monthly pricing plans and so it's mm-hmm. cheaper service with less options so we're focusing on something that that sets us apart by saying that we offer custom editing uh, to and then we labeled the, the target market professional photographers, which in this case is relatively broad. We then have the ability to be able to break that down in our marketing efforts to portrait photographers, to wedding photographers, etc. Uh, but that's a very simple example of a brand position. We're in the process right now of developing a an app, which is and, and by the time this comes out, hopefully will actually be launched called Milu. And Milu is a, a mobile platform that enables photographers and coordinators to collaborate on the planning process of an event. And and so very simply, oh, wow. we're stating what, they, what the app, the service that the app offers and who that is being offered to. And that way we can, we can keep it very, very simple, very to the point, if you will. Um, in fact, if I look at the, the, the t- so-called tagline for this particular brand, it's the simplest way 
to plan an amazing event. So the emphasis is on simple. We're not offering all the options, all the features, but we're very simply stating that, or we're stating very simply that we will enable you without stress, without complication, without having a massive learning curve to be able to effectively plan your client's event. The longer version of that is Milu is a mobile application that enables photographers, coordinators, and their clients to easily collaborate on the planning and execution of an amazing event. Now, we're, we're a little bit lucky in that we're getting into a, a part of the market that is not very saturated. There are a couple of other companies that are trying to do this. And um, so it's not too difficult to position ourselves as uh, or to position ourselves against a very sparse market at the moment. If we were getting into a market space that was extremely busy, then we'd have to be even more specific, more niche. And I, I would say as a wedding photographer, for example, I'm a, uh, I'm a black and white wedding photographer who photographs skateboarders. Um, that would immediately niche me down. Somebody looking at the whole Ritz Photography brand would, would know exactly what it is that I do. I'm automatically filtering out potential clients. I'm, I'm working to market to a very, very niche market. Um, that helps me narrow down my marketing efforts. So it's amazing what that does for the sake of somebody understanding what I offer, but also helping narrowing down my focus, my activities, and my, and my marketing efforts. And so it has benefits on multiple levels. Does that make sense? Oh, Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I really didn't mean to spend too much time there, but I, I think yeah. I have to give context occasionally for the for the purpose of that that question and the reason why we continue to talk about it and, and the significance that it carries. Because there are yeah. so many photographers out there. We have to make sure that we're actually differentiating ourselves, number one, by offering a service that, that is actually unique. And number two, mm-hmm. communicating the significance of that distinct service in a way that also sets us apart and using words that not necessarily everybody else is using to create some distinction as well. And so that's kind of the purpose behind that, that brand position question. Yeah. You, I, I really like Nathan, we could probably sit and talk all night about this because I've done (laughs) sales. I've done sales in so many different environments and education. And, uh, I worked for a large cell phone company and, and really the, the best way to define sales or positioning, you know, in the words of Al Ray's is to simply get your cl- prospective client to envision themselves in your product. And then that's when you hit them with value. That's when they're like, oh my gosh, I can't live without this. I've got to get this, um, which is why you know, you're know you using their language, not your own language, talking about white balance and exposure level and all this. You're, you're talking about, um, you're, you're talking about, the the ways they see your images i can't think of ways right now but well, you yeah. mentioned you mentioned a word there which is really important that's the word value right so mm. the, the first if we can effectively communicate how we add value to that person's life right off mm. the bat they're like oh i kind of like what you were just saying nick oh i need that right if i have mm-hmm. a service that i that that i can offer to that individual or to that couple and they're like i need that well, the, the first way that I may be doing that, for example, with a, with a wedding couple uh, or somebody who's getting married is they need a wedding photographer. So I immediately solve that problem for them, right? Because that's what we're doing. We're, we're adding value, but ultimately what we're doing is we're solving a problem. I have a problem. I need a wedding photographer. Okay, that's number one. But now, of course, everybody likes to at least see themselves as unique. Now, there are certain preferences that they have with regards to photographic style or the way that they want their photogra- the, the photographer to engage with them during the wedding day. And so that is now going to help niche down the type of photographer, the type of wedding photographer that they're looking for. And so you can speak to that particular niche. It, you do run the risk of, of kind of filtering out a bunch of the market. If you say, I am a black and white skateboard wedding photographer, you're going to immediately get rid of probably 95% of the market, right? Yeah. And of course, that's just one tiny example. But I only say that just because it's drastic. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for when we talk about the idea of a brand position is be drastic in your communication. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't do anything else. But in the marketing effort, if you say, I'm a black and white skateboard wedding photographer, now you've got a very, very specific niche market to go after. Everything that you do in your marketing efforts, your design efforts for your website, mm-hmm. the type of photography that you're offering is going to cater to that market and it is going to automatically 
stand out. Whereas if you go to a lot of photographers' websites, they all just kind of look a dime a dozen. They look very, very similar. They use a lot of the same verbiage. And it's hard to really tell the difference between one or the other. And it comes down to subjectivity and potentially connection with that photographer if, mm-hmm. if you have the opportunity to meet them. But the significance here of the brand position is it drives, it can really drive everything that we do. And that simplifies mm-hmm. our lives and it helps save a ton of time, which is so much of what the podcast is about. And so that's where that, that's where the so-called value proposition is of the brand position is we're able to effectively communicate the value that we offer to a very specific niche market and doing so then separating ourselves from the other photographers in our market. Yep. You are so right. There's so much psychology there of making a client based, not a creative artist based decision and how you market and create products and all of that. I mean, just going generally create the creative industry would be blessed to make customer centric choices and everything that created value. So it's it's true. Now, I have to say in the flip side here, and then I promise we're moving on for everybody listening in. They're like, all right, he's talking about this now for like 15 minutes. The, the, the flip side of this conversation, which certainly can't be minimized, and we've alluded to it already, is the personality. Now, ideally, somebody gets to connect with you. Well, Nick, we'll use you as the example because you're a wonderful example of this. Somebody has the opportunity to connect with you in person or at least over the phone. And as I mentioned earlier, the energy that your voice carried when you and I first started talking earlier was contagious. It was infectious. It, it mm-hmm. almost kind of made me smile um, just hearing the tone in your voice because it, it you made me feel like you actually wanted to have a conversation. You were excited to have a conversation. That's immediately going to draw me in. And then you have the opportunity to be able to connect on a deeper level as a result because that person says, oh, Nick's interested in me. He actually wants to connect with me. And now this is not just a simple transaction anymore. Anymore. I, he actually wants to connect with me as a human being. And I feel lost in that noise we were talking about earlier of everybody just kind of being a number. Nick actually wants to connect with me as a human being. And I feel that that experience cannot be minimized. And, and I don't want to minimize it in this conversation of a brand position. Uh, the caveat being that we don't always have the opportunity for that phone call or for that coffee meeting or whatever it may be. But Nick, you are a, an amazing example of how somebody can communicate through a, an energy in their voice and the way that they're engaging with that person, how you can almost immediately convert them as a client. And uh, you you had me sold. Well, thank you. That's probably the best <laughs> compliment I have ever received. I appreciate that, man. Absolutely. Well, and, and so everybody, I, we've, I know we've parked here for a little while, but it, there's been a lot of points of discussion with regards to brand position um, and also a wonderful example in Nick of somebody who communicates that energy through the way that he engages. And I think it's really important to remember that that we do that. It's it's tough sometimes, especially when you're it's with you know friends and family who kind of see day in and day out. I was thinking about this even with my kids as of late. At, there's been a little bit higher stress levels at work, and and uh, my son and I were briefly having a conversation about this today. That's kind of carried over into the way that I've engaged with them. I acknowledge that, even apologize to him for that today, and that's something that I want to remember: the way that I engage, not just with my potential clients, but also those close to me. That I carry that energy that says, "Hey, I want to have a conversation with you." I want to connect with you. I think that's really important as well. Let's keep moving though. I am curious, Nick, in your experience, and you said you've been in business now, uh, is it seven years? Is that right? Seven years. Yes. What has been the biggest lesson that you've learned as a business owner so far? Yeah. So I got your email, what, two or three days ago, and I just sat there and I thought for a long time and so many things came to mind, but there was one that really streamed across so many categories and it was best captured by my friend and business coach, Kevin. He said, Nick, you cannot manage what you do not measure. Hmm. And what he meant by that, and he was talking about everything in a business, but for me in particular, and what he was graciously calling me out on was cash flow management. You, you know, you need to know your bottom line, you need to calculate yourself for growth, and you need to stay consistent with that. And I mean, gosh, how, like how many issues or questions or, or exciting new opportunities can be solved with just knowing your numbers? Yeah, that was. That's huge. That was it. No, no, that's absolutely. I was going to almost just kind of let that sit there because you summed it up wonderfully. 
Um, I and I have to say that I can empathize with probably some of those feelings that you went through as you were getting that advice and then trying to figure out how to shift your approach to running your business because this was a massive weakness of mine as a wedding photographer and and then starting other companies as well. That that process of understanding or the importance understanding the significance of numbers and how that drives literally everything. And this is not just financial numbers, but data everywhere, right? Looking at the the traffic to your website, the engagement mm-hmm. level with your website. Mm-hmm. Um, this is this is one area. But when we look at the the numbers, when it comes to the actual finances, if we're not actually proactive and first of all creating awareness around those, taking advantage of tools like QuickBooks. Uh, online to look at the numbers, see where the income is coming from, see where the expenses mm-hmm. are going, and figure out how to make adjustments in order to make those numbers look even better. Uh, we're missing out on what what can actually be a, a very empowering uh, experience of running a mm-hmm. business. You know, I, I used to get so stressed out about the numbers, but it, uh, ironically, it was because I didn't really know the numbers. Uh, if exactly. I had taken a more <laughs> if I had taken a more proactive <sighs> approach, the the stress would have largely gone away. And so I'm glad that you bring this point up. What was once you once you had that realization, you got that advice from your business coach. What was the shift that you made? Well, the first thing I did was I sat down and I calculated my base level of income that I required, and my prices shot up. Um, was really that first move of, okay, if I'm going to shoot weddings, I cannot take a price that puts me deeper in the hole. Yeah. I, I, I can't. And, and even for that, like it, it's so easy for creatives who are working with people to be so emotional about it that they forget that, man, their choice to take business doesn't just affect them. It affects their family, their friends, their interactions with their clients. And, and further, like that's going to affect how you pay your insurance and how you upgrade your equipment and pay for services that create a greater experience. And, and so it's just, it hits, I mean, it, it just hits everything. My whole world changed when I just sat down and calculated my numbers and and I can confidently look at every client and say, you know what, if I, how do I put it? You know, I have sat down and honestly calculated what I need to make every wedding. Um, and you can trust me that I'm not taking advantage of you in that price. And you're also going to get a photographer who's excited to work with you. Yeah. yeah so and largely because yeah. you don't have the stress of worrying about whether or not you're making any money, not enough money anymore. Right. Yep, and you're not paying one bill with a check that's coming in from someone else. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Good, good advice. Good reminder, and and I love the emphasis on that. Uh, let's talk about time. So you're you're putting this time and effort and energy into continuing to build your business, develop your business. Uh, it's easy, especially when it's, we're doing something that we love, to get caught up in that process. Uh, but then there's there's some significance to making time. Uh, some might say for for yourself, for the sake of your health, uh, mentally, physically, mm-hmm. but but particularly for the sake of relationships, right? I know that a lot of people. I, mean, I look at somebody like Gary Vaynerchuk, who a lot of people know about, and he's he's quite the the marketing guru and has a lot of advice and knowledge to offer. But you see him working just insane amounts of hours every week. But he talks about how he mm-hmm. derives amazing amounts of energy from that process. Mm -hmm. And so I realize that some people are wired wired that way, but nothing can enter or or, or take away from relationships like Mm -hmm. time or lack of time committed to those relationships. And so a business can get in the way of those relationships. We have to make time for the important people in your life. How do you go about creating that space, both for yourself and for others? Oh, wow. Well, I'm definitely not Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, for sure. And, and he is, he has made some clear choices about what his priorities are in life. And, and that's him. And, and man, he is doing a great job and his family loves him. So good on him. For me personally, like my best time tip, and this is going to sound so simple, is just focus eliminate the distractions, do one thing at a time. I sat down and I was running through apps and, you know, you, I've got cold turkey on my computer to keep me off Instagram when I'm editing and all this. But like at the, at the end of the day, really the best time saving tip is just doing the work. Hmm. It, it sounds so simple, but it's like, man, get up in the morning, eat your frog, do the hard thing first 
get it done, and then you have the rest of the day, like plan your priorities right, and then you don't have to worry about managing your time. You don't have to worry about if you're making progress. So the best time saver is is actually spending your time well. <laughs> and just doing it. I love that too. And you make a great point, which is do the difficult thing or maybe put another way because it may not necessarily be difficult, but the thing that's going to have the, the biggest impact on your business, mm-hmm. right? If something that we've talked about in the podcast a lot is focusing on the proactive versus the reactive. So if you do two, three, four things in the morning that are proactive in nature, i.e. they um, are helping you get to a place where you're increasing your client base or increasing your bottom line. It's mm-hmm. actually moving your business forward. It's not just busy work. If you do that and you get those things done in the morning, you know that anything the rest of the day is just kind of gravy. And and I love the idea of starting off the day with those things and you know that you're consistently moving your, your business forward. So again, great advice. And and you're right. It sounds so simplistic, but at the end of the day, just do it. Stop overthinking it. And, and this is, I'm preaching to myself here too. Stop overthinking it. Stop process, you know, quote unquote, processing it. I'm processing it. Um, just do the thing. And you may have to course correct later, but now you're actually doing things. You're getting things done and you're actually moving forward. You can always course correct later. It doesn't have to be just perfect. Yeah. Yeah. For all those photographers out there, uh, you like you don't need to clean your desk to sit down and work, right? <laughs> you like you make yeah. all these little micro distractions for yourself, yeah. like having your phone next to you or whatever. Like you don't need any of that. Just sit down. And that, and I'm saying this to myself, like, I, please, like I am the last person in the line of having this this right. I, I'm the creative in this discussion as we chatted before. Um, but yeah, just sit, sitting down and focusing. I actually have noise canceling headphones for a lot of my tasks, particularly computer based tasks. So that's good. Well, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm certainly raising my hand there too. I, you, it's funny you talk about, <laughs> I was laughing because you talk about cleaning your desk. I do that literally and figuratively, whether it's actually maybe cleaning something or, you know, going into my computer and organizing something, or it used to be mm-hmm. I, I, for the longest time, I was trying to find the, the perfect task and project management system. And the amount of time I spent doing that <laughs> oh, instead yes. of actually just getting the things done is, is <sighs> embarrassing to even consider. So <laughs> just do the work. That's, are... Yeah, that's, re- that's really, really Nathan, great. Advice. We, have, we have done the same thing so many times. <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Hey, so leading up to our conversation, you emailed me, I think this was yesterday, you sent me an interesting list of just kind of random facts about yourself. One of the things that you yes. mentioned uh, is that you read a book every two weeks or so. Yeah. And and you said you're currently immersed in reading about the science of sleep. So I don't know if you want to recommend that particular book or if there's a different book that's made, maybe just mention one or two that have made just significant impact on your life, whether that's personally or professionally. Yeah, the uh, I could talk about sleep forever because I'm realizing it's a huge part of your life, which is why it's one third of your life. But I think I may have mentioned it. Consistent cash flow by Tom Paulswix. Okay, uh, he's he's with Action Coach, and that was the book that helped me really master cash flow and having a having a budget statement and everything. But really, kind of like where our conversation will be going is going to be So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. Hmm. And he just talks about that uh, Steve Martin idea of how do you become so good that nobody can ignore you. So, Wow. Yeah. And I, I'm going to leave that sitting there because I, I can see, I mean, obviously I have the outline. I know the direction the conversation is going, but I think what we're going to actually end up doing is talking about that idea of being so good that people can't ignore you on a much larger scale. We're, we're going to be talking about developing editing style, mm-hmm. but I think it's going to end up being a much broader conversation. So we'll get there in just a second. Yeah. With regards to reading a book every two weeks or so, I, we talk. We were just kind of joking around about how it's easy to get caught up in the the process rather than getting the thing mm-hmm. done. Do you ever find yourself taking in so much information that you can't effectively apply it? Uh, all of that information that you're taking in. Yes, I am. I am educated beyond my obedience, man. <laughs> I just, like, oh man, I I read so much. You know, everybody. I would say my chief distraction, and I've had to limit myself, is reading because I'll jump to a book if I want to get excited or learn something, but not actually like. And that's why I love. I don't know if you saw this in the email. I'm jumping into computer programming and coding. Yeah. Is like. 
man, the only way you can truly learn computer programming and coding is just getting in and doing the task. Mm. And, um, man, I could list off to you a hundred books that I've read in the last like two years, but how many of them have I taken the time to make a plan to live it out? I guess. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, right. well, and and again, this is something that I've, that I've realized for myself. I've actually taken a break Mm -hmm. from reading business books at the moment because I feel like I've taken in so much information. There's plenty there that I need to do a better job of more consistently living out, for example, Mm -hmm. basic principles in my personal life and then in business as well. And if I do those things, I'm going to, I'm likely going to be as successful as I need to be. And there's something to be said for continuing to grow, but it's so easy in this day and age to, you know, we have such easy access to so much information that we can consume and consume and consume and consume. And then what are we actually doing with that? What are we actually creating from that? And uh, this is still something that I need to work on, but I I was curious to get your take on that. I think it's important for all of us to remember, for those of you listening in, take the information in, but then make sure you're actually doing something with it too. Mm -hmm. Don't just kind of make yourself feel better by taking in information. If you're not doing anything with it, then what's the point in the end? So I I think that's a great reminder for us. And thanks for kind of talking us through that, Nick. That's really, really good. Let's let's kind of get into the photography side of things here. And first of all, we're, we're going to talk about editing in a second, but let's talk about your camera bag. What's something really unusual in your camera bag, and this doesn't have to be a camera or lens or otherwise, that that makes you a better photographer? Yeah, so I actually have these fractal prisms, but getfractals.com has these very well-designed prisms that actually have handles on them. And so you can hold a, a, a light prism very easily and just create some very cool reflective images and and stuff so i usually you know reception dies down during a wedding i'll pull out one of those prisms and do a bunch of creative shots and stuff of the bride and groom so yeah the the fractal get fractal prisms get fractal okay cool we'll link to that in the show notes too and for those of you listening in Mm -hmm. Uh, Boca Podcast, B-O-K-E-H podcast.com. Obviously, this is the, the, the podcast you're listening to, but the show notes, <laughs> Haley does a wonderful job producing the podcast and putting together show notes to go along with the show. That's links to the resources that we talk about, including the one that we just mentioned with this prism, um, the, the talking points that Nick has during our conversation, the summation, basically, of the podcast itself. If you, you want to go back and review and look at this information, you can do that. Go to bocapodcast.com. Some of you may have a podcast player that enables you to kind of look at the show notes uh, in the podcast player itself. Some of them format kind of weird, uh, but you might be able to do that as well. Either way, take advantage of those resources, and uh, we'll certainly link to this prism in the show notes as well. I, I want to deviate from our outline here a second, Nick. Uh, you mentioned also in that email that you sent to me uh, that you're a fitness fanatic, uh, and mm. you lost 35 pounds back in 2017. So what was the the shift that you made in your life that enabled you to do that? Yeah, yes, yes, you are right. Uh, you know, the gym is my happy hour. So I love it. So the shift was kind of right out of uh, a year or two out of college, I just noticed my health dipping, just not sleeping well. I knew the food I was eating wasn't that great. And, you know, when you're a photographer, your schedule and sometimes even your food schedule, if you don't plan it, is just so sporadic and spontaneous. And the food you eat isn't always what you'd hope for or plan. So I was sitting at, I think, you know, right around 170 pounds, but what I think was probably around you know, like a, a, a buy fat percentage of like 30%. So I was, you know, from a kid who you enter, was in high school at 105 pounds, like that's a huge difference. And wow. I wouldn't say there was, you know, I, I'd put on quite a bit of weight. So that was the kind of the, the changing moment. I found a, a book and an author named Mike Matthews, who wrote Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. Have you heard of him? I, that, the title of the book sounds familiar. Yeah. So he's one of the biggest, if not the biggest self-published fitness author on Amazon. I mean, like every product he has, has like 5,000 to 10,000 positive reviews. Okay, His stuff just flies off the shelf of Amazon. But so I got his book, I read his book. And then what I specifically did was, is okay, I don't understand nutrition. And this seems to be one of the big keys. I know there's a lot of moving parts, but I had his company write me a meal plan Okay. And then what I did was, is I focused on learning the 
training aspect because I knew I had to get active. So I started doing barbell uh, bench press, deadlifts, squats, dumbbell press, like all the stuff that like, I don't know, I think of the, the bro stuff <laughs> um, at the gym. I, I started doing that. And, you know, over the process of seven months losing, you know, a pound and a half a week, I lost 35 pounds. Wow. Ate the same food every day. And, and it was a slow, it, it, it was one of the most, I learned a ton in that season about food, portion control, quality of food, calorie counting. Uh, I, I just learned so much and I'm super thankful for Mike Matthews and all that he does. So, well, and, and just to give some context to the conversation, some of you may, may wonder why I'm bringing up the topic of health, but the reality is particularly as wedding photographers, it's important that we keep ourselves in good shape to minimize the mm. incredible amounts of exhaustion and potential soreness that can come from shooting a very long wedding day. And, you know, I mean, the, the other thing too is, especially for those of you who are willing to start the day with a workout, the, the boost that it can give you uh, and focus and energy is really, really incredible. Mm-hmm. The endorphin rush is, it's, I mean, it's a nice boost to your day. And then how you feel about yourself as a result too. I mean, there's a lot of conversation in our culture right now about just kind of accepting yourself as you are. And there's some significance to that mm-hmm. to a point, but not so ironically, we're actually getting ready to talk about the significance of pushing yourself to get better. And I think there's something to be said for this, even when it comes to our physical health too, not to beat yeah. ourselves up, but at the same time, realize that we might be able to be better in one area or another and actually working toward that. And health is one of those areas that we can continue to improve in. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm stoked for and, and impressed by the work that you've done and what you've accomplished. And I think it's a great example for all of us. I do have one specific question that is about yes. diet. Did you find yourself, uh, was it an overly complicated process having to kind of shift the way that you ate and track calories? It was not simple because I went to my, I went to my refrigerator and I went to my uh, pantry and I threw everything away and, and I bought everything that Mike's company told me to buy. And and I just stuck with that. So it was just, I picked to focus on training, but then as I'm following this meal plan for months and I'm reading more and more about nutrition and fitness, what he was prescribing made so much more sense. Like the difference between high glycemic and low glycemic and acting carbs and, you know, the amount of protein you eat and your, your body is not what you eat. Your body is what you it does with what you eat, mm. you know, it's just, Oh, there's, and, and you're right. I, I was, I was just listening to another podcast about how if you exercise your brain activity actually is measurably going up throughout the day and it creates circadian rhythm to help you sleep. And yeah. gosh, yeah. So, so much, big. so much benefit there, but it, it just takes, I mean, to our earlier conversation, it takes just doing it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and even if it's small yeah. steps getting started, is, is really important. But I, you mentioned mm-hmm. the significance of counting calories. And I know that there's, I mean, the conversation around health has been relatively rampant in the photography industry. So I, I think this is pretty relevant. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that comes up, whether it's in the photo industry or outside of it, is the conversation mm-hmm. about tracking calories, not tracking calories. There is a lot of significance to the idea that you need to have a decent ratio of certain types or the right ratio of certain types of food for the sake of your health. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to lean out, if you want those abs to pop back up, you have to, to make the, the little bit of extra effort. And, and part of that, and certainly I've found significant benefit in this process, is tracking calories for the sake of understanding the significance of how your body burns those calories and how it responds as a result, uh, or how it b- burns a particular number of calories and how it responds as a result. So I per- personally consume roughly 1,700 calories a day, which is on the low side for my height. I'm 5'11". Yeah, I was, was going to say, that's, that's low. It is, but I also know, and, and so this is where the subjectivity piece comes in. I also yeah. know that that my body lived at that space for a long time where I was very, very lean, very skinny. I think in okay. college I was at like 170 pounds or so, very, very skinny. But that was kind of mm-hmm. my, my stasis, right? The, the happy place where my yep. body was used to functioning. After I left home and I didn't have the discipline and the structure of my very strict household living at home, I just kind of ate any and everything. And I just, I blew up like Mm. a balloon. I was 247 pounds, I think at my, my highest, somewhere in that realm, just very, very big. 
So I yeah. I'm now back down to 100 and between 180 and 185, and and I have abs, and I'm going to be 40 this month, and I'm really stoked by that. But there are various yeah. elements that have played into that. One of which is understanding how calories. Uh, or the significance of calories. And I make, you know, I take the whatever it is, the three, four minutes a day to actually track calories and the results that I've seen, in addition to some of the other things, uh, have been quite significant. And so I only emphasize that to to make a point, which is if you want to take it to the next level, doing something like taking three or four minutes a day to track the calories of your food will give you that much more awareness, which enables you to make that much bigger a difference. And uh, so I I wanted to highlight that because you pointed out the significance of calories, Nick. Yes. Well, and dude, I've, I've been seeing your progress picks in, and I'm encouraged by you. It's so cool to see you putting that out there for one, just putting it out there. Cause that is not something I could do. <laughs> but second, like, man, you're, you're proving that rule wrong where people feel like things like taking your health seriously and having muscle development after the age of 30, you're, you're breaking those rules. And, and that's what a lot of truly people who are aware of the science of health and nutrition and fitness are saying, look, like you don't lose testosterone uh, after a certain age. And so like, I love that you are using your platform to just do a quality of life is not everything like goodness gracious, like life is not meant to be luxury all the time, but it, it really does like when I can wake up with a clear mind and know what I'm going to eat every day yeah. and I know that I can execute overall, like I just didn't like the simple thing is I could just enjoy life more. Um, and for that, the, I, I do want to take one little tangent if I could just t- do yeah, that man, go for it. in this, in this discussion, like everybody's arguing, you know, macros, calories, and I've sat down with my friends, with my family And I've said, look, like, if you want to be vegetarian, great. If you want to be keto, great, whatever. Everything has proteins, carbs, and fats. So each gram of carbs has four calories. Each gram of protein has four calories. And each gram of fat has nine calories. So, like, whatever you want, have at it. Like, I tell people, is it macros or calories? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all the same thing. It's what whatever you want to put in that formula. Just make sure the, the math of your equation fits your body type and your calorie count yep. and your nu- nutritional needs. You can do whatever diet you want. Um, and well, I'll, I'll stop there because I... I <laughs> well, there, there is... I mean, you mentioned math and, and uh, I love the wide-ranging conversation that we've had today, but I, I'll, I'll end yes. with this. When yeah. we talk about the significance of macros and calories, the reality is that not all, our, not all of our bodies function exactly the same way. Now, there are basic principles right. behind how we eat and how we exercise that are, are almost universal. Uh, but when it comes to the the, the details, the nitty gritty, the number of calories, for example, I, I mentioned 1,700, 1,750 calories a day. I add to that if I go and spend time on doing some cardio, for example. So I'll add an additional 250 calories or so to figure into that. So it ends up being about 2,000 calories a day that I'm consuming. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know that that for my body, what how that results and, and my ability to be able to build muscle and to lean out simultaneously, how my body looks, uh, how I feel that that's a good place for me. And part of that, again, comes from what my body was used to for so long and kind of getting back to that place and then, and then bettering it, like you're talking about, adding a little bit of muscle and, and, um, and, and doing, doing some of this work partially for the sake of the hormonal benefit too, even as I age. Mm-hmm. But the, the math does make a big difference. Um, and being aware of that math is important. When you, when you look at your resting metabolic rate, so if you were to literally lay down yes, all day BMR. long how much, how many calories is your body going to burn? Now that, that will vary from person to person and taking the time to go get that measured accurately. So you have an awareness of that and then basing your calorie intake on that is important. By the way, I'm going to add a little caveat here. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a trainer. This is just what I've learned from studying yeah, over the yeah. years, <laughs> but that is important to be aware of that and to build your diet around that. Something else too, macros are important. I tend to consume a pretty large percentage of um, pretty healthy fats, some protein and some carbs. Now, my body responds actually really, really well to eating white rice. A lot of people would be like, if I eat rice, you know, and my girlfriend, for example, she's like, if I eat rice, my, you know, I, I tend to kind of bloat. My body actually responds really well to it. And I think at least part of that is the fact that uh, it's a little bit even genetic, maybe. My my grandparents, uh, my dad, 
they lived in Japan. They ate quite a bit of rice. I grew up in Japan. I ate quite a bit of rice back then. My body's used to consuming and processing that. And so I'd love to go out for sushi. It, it feels clean, and my body responds really, really well to that. That may be a little bit different for somebody else. So you have to make adjustments and tweaks based on how your body responds. But the math actually matters, and we can't simply throw away the significance of calories or macros because it will have an effect on taking things to the next level. If you just want to drop 5 or 10 pounds, no big deal, that's fine. If you want to get the abs back, if you want to put on muscle, if you want to build a particular body composition, now you need to take things next level and, and taking the, or making the effort to look at those numbers is important. I use an app called MyFitnessPal that's free, it's easy to use, it's easy to pull food from. And uh, it's made a big, big difference. I've used it on and off for years. And uh, that has enabled me to, to, as part of what has enabled me to get where I am. And so we'll link to that in the show notes too for anybody curious. Yep. All yeah. right. Well, Nick, we, we have hit like the, the gamut. And I know that we could probably take another <laughs> hour or two to, to, to continue to hit a variety of topics. But I want to get into our primary focus for, for today, believe it or not, uh, 50 minutes yeah. in, um, about <laughs> this topic that you actually brought to me, which is... Um, Practical Steps to Evolving Editing Style. Now, this is an interesting conversation. Obviously, I own an editing company, and I have mm-hmm. my own, honestly, my own opinions about the significance of editing style and, and how that relates to how mm-hmm. much business we, we uh, are able to book, how we're able to build our businesses. Uh, but I want to get your take on this conversation. And you actually, an email that you sent to me a little while back, you said, I'll be the first to admit that sometimes I fall into Instagram scrolling. Uh, by the way, I do the same thing. Uh, you said, but I found myself saying was scrolling is bad, but you feel there is a gap between where you are and where you want to edit. These people are pointing out that you can still get better. I may fall into an apo- unpopular opinion, which is this. I think looking at the work of others and feeling the gap of where you want to be is a good thing. That feeling can propel growth if we can frame it in our minds properly and take a clear course of action to get to our goal. Our greatest problems and, gain- and pains cause the greatest art and innovation in history, right? We expound on your thoughts here, Nick, because this is a this is a really interesting point of conversation. We kind of alluded to this earlier. You know, as much political correctness as there is right now in our culture around you're okay just as you are. Um, you know, stay off Instagram so you don't feel bad about yourself. This is a sh- kind of a shift in in the conversation. But you talked about the significance of framing this the right way. So how do you frame this so that it can actually be positive? Yeah, yeah, you know, and I feel like I'm I'm opening up podcasts every other day and hearing someone talk about how they feel negative when they get on social media or Instagram. Um, and there, man, there are so many different ways people are maybe having a negative experience on those. So I'm I am one one individual here as we're talking. Um, I, so as I see you that email. I had two thoughts in mind. My first thought was I'm scrolling through Instagram and I'm mad because this person is better than me and I feel bad about myself. That's the surface level thought. And then the next thought I, I, I almost, I just stopped and I was like, well, let's go deeper here. Like if, if one of your life mottos is owning the responsibility of your life, is it their fault you feel bad? Absolutely not. I, I really want to just kind of pause on that question right there, because I think this is a question that like just needs to, to resound through our popular culture at the moment, um, it, because it actually involves taking responsibility for ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. That's an interesting yep. one. Okay, sorry. Please keep going. <laughs> I'll leave that as it is. No, it's, it's so, it is so the, 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 the heart of life is learning to let go of what is not your responsibility and then truly owning what is your responsibility. Yeah. Because what I ultimately came to, it, it, and this is kind of like what I, what I had in my notes, is, it, uh, it, is this happening because it shows me how I want to be better, but then I'm not taking ownership to get to where they have worked hard to be. Mm. That was... Ultimately, you know, some of the really the superstars that I'm looking at, the reason they are at where they're at is for very wonderful reasons that they put in the hours and the years to get there. And, and it's it's me having a bad emotional reaction to what they have taken 
all this time and effort to build. And, and going back to our, the beginning of our conversation, it's probably because they got focused, right? And they just did one thing for a really, really long time. Well, it, it's so. true, but I, I like, again, I want to go back to that question. It's it, mm-hmm. you, and it's all in how you frame it, right? Is this something mm-hmm. that is, well, I guess really, even before we ask these questions, taking a step back and mm-hmm. saying, why do I feel the way that I do? So if I'm mm-hmm. looking at, at Instagram and I'm scrolling through Instagram and I feel badly about myself because here's this, this male model who looks better than I do, or here's this photographer mm-hmm. who takes a picture that's prettier than the one that I took the other day, or here's this person who's got a nicer motorcycle than I do, or whatever it is, whatever is most relevant to me or to our listeners, why do I feel bad about that, number one? And then number two, who's mm-hmm. responsible for that feeling? I guess it really kind of goes hand in hand. Um, understanding the root of those feelings and then not putting the responsibility of addressing the root of those feelings on somebody else. It, it, it really, it shifts. I mean, this isn't really just a conversation about Instagram and photography. This is about life and the significance of taking responsibility for our lives. And, and Nick, I realize, and I have to, to emphasize for you because you're such a nice guy. I, I know that you're not here to preach and tell everybody how they should feel. Uh, but I think this is actually a really important conversation that that needs to be had on a grander scale. I'm glad that's come up today. I hope it continues to come up on the podcast, which is let's not continue to push responsibility on everybody else for us feeling bad. Instead, let's take a step back, develop a bit of self-awareness, understand where those feelings come from. Mm-hmm. And as you said, let the things go that aren't our responsibility. And then the things that we that we have the ability to make change toward, then let's take responsibility for that and put the work in and make the change. And uh, look at it as an opportunity to grow, to get better, and and you know not put the responsibility on Instagram to, to remove the the number of likes from an image so we don't feel bad about ourselves. That that's such a band aid surface level way of approaching mm-hmm. the conversation. We need to understand why we feel bad and address it on a deeper psychological level. So I'm glad you bring this up. Yep, I heard someone say. If you are having a bad time on Instagram, it's because you're making it about yourself. It's like, man, <laughs> that is it. I talk about knock me out of my seat. Yeah, I just like, you know, and, and gr- thankfully they were like, OK, if you're in this place, feel bad and correct yourself. And here's what you need to do. And, and I just got on Instagram and I started celebrating other people and and it was just a complete heart change of like man i am making my life like my short time on this earth about myself and really you talk about how clients love when our our conversation about positioning clients love it when we get excited about them and and i've found man the more i just celebrate other people or even just celebrate in life rather than make it about what i don't have or Mm. making it about myself Mm -hmm the more I just love life. Um, it, 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 so if you're, it, I, I had to say this to myself, if you're having a bad, if you're having a bad time on Instagram, then, then you're making it about yourself, either get off or turn around and make it about other people. Ooh, so, I like and, that. Yeah. Well, when, when the focus goes outward, no longer is it about our ego and how we feel, right? Our insecurities. And that's what so mm-hmm. many of these conversations where people, instead of looking at a situation and say, oh man, that person is better than me in this way or that. And, and to your point, Nick, congratulations. That's amazing. Props to you for mm-hmm. putting the work in, for doing the time to make that thing happen. That is incredible. I'd love to learn your technique. But in the meantime, let me set aside my ego, realize that, I, that I'm not as good at you in this particular thing. That does not mm-hmm. detract from my value as a human being. It just means mm-hmm. that there's an opportunity here, if I want to, to make myself better. Now, how do I go, I go about doing that? And how do I go about putting the time, the work, the effort, the energy into doing that? It's no longer about me it's, 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 and, and my insecurities. And I think that's where a lot of this conversation lies. A lot of people kind of waste a lot of time around the conversation. They, they experience a ton of stress around these, these issues mm-hmm. because their insecurities are taking over. And that's where the conversation ends. If we realize our insecurities are about us feeling bad about how somebody else is going to see us and, and realize that on a very kind of a deeper psychological level, we can address those issues in and of themselves. But then we can look at these opportunities where we see somebody else is better than us and, and use that as fuel to become better at what we do. And I think that's a much healthier way to go about it. And and to go back to Nick's point again, focus on on somebody else instead of ourselves. And I'm saying this to myself too, because I can fall into this trap. Focus on somebody else. 
and how great they are, encourage them, prop them up, and and then take op- advantage of opportunities to learn from them to get better. And so, I, I mean, th- we could stop the podcast right here because this is good food for thought. Neither Nick nor I are <laughs> making any dogmatic statements. I think we're both learning through this, and, and I hope this is all encouraging conversation for everybody listening in that just, if nothing else, take some time, take a step back, and consider why you feel what you do about these experiences where you feel a little bit less than. Uh, address those insecurities, understand that it is an ego issue, and then figure out how you might be able to continue to improve yourself as a photographer, as an individual, your health or or otherwise. There's wonderful opportunity to continue to improve there, and that does not make you less a human in the process. And we, I think we have to separate those, separate our ego from opportunities to improve. That there's just no reason the two have to to coexist um, in this in this conversation. But that aside, Nick. One of the ways that we can continue to improve potentially is in our editing style. And maybe improve isn't even necessarily the word here. Maybe evolve is the word. Uh, But how do you define editing style? Yes. So I, again, just sat there and thought about this question for a little bit. But the definition for editing style that I came to was it is a consistent set of preferred editing choices across a portfolio that reflects what makes an artist uh, unique or themselves. Okay. And and I like the word consistent there too, because there is a tendency, I think we all have to kind of experiment here and there, try this thing or that. And then you look at somebody's Mm -hmm. Instagram feed and you're like, how many times did they change their style in (laughs) in the last year or two? Mm -hmm. Um, consistency is important for the sake of a brand, or it can be anyway. But this is an interesting definition and very well thought out. And uh, what we'll write this definition out, put it in the show notes for those of you listening in if you want kind of a point of reference. But I'm curious, Nick, how your editing style has maybe evolved over the last seven years. Oh, gosh, man, I actually deleted my old Instagram profile years ago, which had the bulk of it. But it's I mean, started out like I was posting images straight off my camera. Uh, Then Nathan, I don't know if you went through this phase, but like the first time I touched the contrast knob, I just thought I had found like the golden ticket to the best images. (laughs) Um, It was like, Oh gosh, I just, I, um, I opened some of those images. This, this, uh, this interview made me open up some of my old images and I look and I kind of, I kind of cringe, but at the same time, I'm like, man, yeah, okay, that was what I chose to do. So it was like saturated, contrasty. Uh, and then I was also at that point, the F1.4 all the time photographer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, gosh, I thought I was the best. And then, <laughs> and then I thought it was so cool. And and uh, and a, a photographer in the Spokane area at the time politely pointed out, he's like, I think I I don't think your subject is all in focus. <laughs> yeah, and he's kind of green uh, from the contrast. Oh, and wow. I was like, oh, ooh. So uh, yeah, I mean, I've gone through all the phases, bright and airy, and then um, like really a, a kind of a, a big turning point for me uh, was in 2016. I went to uh, so kind of a little bit of a story, but I was chatting with my friend Laura. And she was talking about this camp out in Joshua Tree. So I went and checked it out. Turns out that was the Heck Yeah Photo Camp with Ben Sasso and Kat Silva. I think Ryan Longnecker was there, Laura Jade. But really that, kind of that moment, and I would love your feedback on this point. I would really love your feedback on this point. But the thing that changed me the most was when Parker Fitzgerald Uh, who's a commercial photographer based out of Portland, uh, coincidentally, said the consistency of your editing is always in the opacity of your blacks. And everybody on stage nodded. And I was like, huh. So I wrote that down. And the first thing I did when I got home is I opened up my entire portfolio. I neutralized the exposure. I neutralized the contrast. And I just started messing with the blacks. Okay. And I just saw how tied to color and white balance and even clarity of images that the blacks were. Yeah. So that was, so I'm curious, that isn't uh, where I'm at now, but I'm curious what your feedback is on that. You know, I, I, I want to sound important and intellectual here and have some really wonderful answer in response to it. In my mind, uh, I think very, very practically. So I think about the end result 
and what the client is going to see. Um, I know, and actually, even as a photographer, I, I look at snapshots, like blurry, imperfect snapshots of my kids and me on my refrigerator. I've got gobs of these little mini Instax prints on the refrigerator, and me and my mm-hmm. kids and my girlfriend and so forth. And the last thing that I care about is the nuance of the contrast or the nuance of the white balance or the nuance of the sharpness. I'm not zooming in with mm. a magnifying glass, looking at these things to make sure they're absolutely perfect. It's the fact that I'm in those photos. Mm. Now, I like a pretty photo um, and I like mm-hmm. a well-processed image. But mm-hmm. to answer your question very simply, as a, as a photographer, I don't, add, I don't so much care about the nuance of the opacity of the blacks. I'm not getting to mm. that nitty gritty. Now, I have to add a big caveat here that I understand that a lot of photographers put importance on those details and those nuances, mm. but I just, I look at it. And, and so we accommodate those things. I mean, my photographer's edit is very simply, as we talked about earlier, about custom editing and the, the lengths to which we go to accommodate the highly, highly, highly nuanced preferences of our, you know, mm. the thousands of photographers that we've had the opportunity to work with over the last 10 years plus um, is quite extensive. So we, we accommodate those things. On a very practical level, though, I look at those nuances, and I know that 99, 98, 99% of the end clients don't care in the least. And so that's where the irony is in this whole conversation is because I know mm-hmm. that the end client who we're ultimately producing these images for, I understand there's significance to our own work for ourselves, but we're giving these images to a client who is not going to notice the nuance of those differences. So that's the that's the first answer that comes to mind. Now, I understand the significance uh, to a point anyway of how the blacks play into the way an image looks. It, it's funny, there's a, there's a tool in uh, an app, a mobile app that I use called Snapseed. Uh, which is an mm-hmm. ambience slider. And the ambience slider plays in the midtones and in the blacks and brings those up. And it's amazing what it does for the image, um, both black and white and color. It's, it's quite fascinating to look at. But on a very grand scale, mm-hmm. I don't have a whole lot to say about those. And, and that's the reason why. I love, yeah, I love your answer. I It was, for me, when I did that, when I heard that, I just had opened up Instagram. One of the, benefits i think in the conversation of consistency that instagram has caused is it allows you to open up a portfolio and see uh, a relative measure of consistency for an artist and and so when i heard that quote i opened up some of my favorite artists and i just noticed the depth or the consistent level of blacks or depth of that was was pretty Consistent. That, and that's actually what created consistency across maybe their Instagram or their portfolio. So that was a huge, huge point for me. That's so. a fascinating thing. And honestly, it's it's an interesting uh, point of consideration that, that I want to pay a little bit more attention to now that now that you bring that up. Because when we are looking at consistency, that is one of the things, I mean, we, working with our editing clients at Photographers Edit, the mm-hmm. conversation of crushing the blacks or bringing the blacks up some mm-hmm. photographers like to kind of crush the blacks. Others like there to be less contrast and, mm-hmm. and less depth to those blacks. I mean, it, it really is so subjective, so preferential. But it's interesting mm-hmm. to look at consistency from that standpoint. So that's something maybe I'll have to spend a little bit more time in. Yeah. Yes. I would say really my current, I'll, I'll just kind of say some names that have really defined my current style Okay. that have really helped. Jordan Daniels, I think she's based out of Arkansas now. And the way she kind of manages her white balances and contrast levels, I try to shoot for every time. And then uh, Olivia Strom, based out of Portland. I don't know if you've heard of her, but man, uh, the way she mutes her tones, her color selection and her control of the tone curve. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I just just love, love her work. So and Olivia, how, how do you spell her last name? S T R O H M. Oh, got it. O H M. Oh, yeah. Olivia Strom photo. I was actually trying to pull this up on Instagram and I'm, I'm scrolling through and I can see what you're talking about, those muted tones. That's quite interesting. Mm-hmm. It's uh, what I've noticed. And, and my, my assumption is it, either she or someone along that line actually really made a push for those crushed highs and those muted tones. It's a, I mean, it's like kind of the thing in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, other than like a lot of split toning and greens and oranges and amber, 
in the colors. So, um, but yeah, she's, she's got a, a pretty Pacific Northwest style. So, well, and we'll have to link to those accounts in the show notes as well. So those of you listening in can, mm. can have a point of reference. You said that these are the couple of photographers that have made kind of the biggest difference recently um, in the development mm-hmm. of your editing style. And have you kind of managed to kind of combine some of those, that the highlights of those two styles into your own work? And how long did it take to, to go about creating that for yourself? Years. Uh, probably I've been, I've been following... Uh, Jordan Daniels probably for two and a half, three years. And, and I really started paying, paying attention to her stuff. Um, and then I think a year and a half ago, I really, really started paying attention to what Olivia Strom was doing partially because I actually met her in person and she's just, you know, like I encourage everybody to meet their heroes in person. Uh, she is just the sweetest human being uh, I have ever met. And I, I love meeting her so much that I started really paying attention to what she was doing. And then kind of segueing and maybe to how we would how we would actually implement this stuff. I really started paying attention to what they were doing in their style. And I tra- started trying to force those things into my images like, hmm. OK, I'm going to look at their images. What do I like about it? And how am I going to create that in my own images or, or even just make what I like about their images my own yeah. in my own way? So, and you just take that into Lightroom and kind of play with the sliders and, and I mean, are you creating a preset for yourself or are you buying somebody else's preset or how are you going about that? Yeah, I am probably your least favorite photographer as far as the amount of presets I have in my uh, Lightroom (laughs) catalog. Uh, I got pretty methodical and even just with the tone curve, I think I have 10 uh, presets alone that control the tone curve and certain tone curve adjustments. And I have them labeled for artists that I really like. And I try and I mimic the portrait curve and uh, with the Visco presets and you know, uh, some film curves that are really popular because of the way they play with the light. And here's the thing that I'm really excited about in editing right now is the tone curve because it forces me to pay attention to the histogram and how I'm collecting the light yeah. as I, as I create an image because, and man, good guys, like if you want to take a good image, I wish somebody had told me this, like you can't edit bad out of a bad image, like take it well, know what you're shooting for, and then you can really control the light uh, in post-processing. So well, to just kind of bring this conversation back around, I and mean, we were talking about the significance of improvement. We're looking at others' work. We see opportunity mm-hmm. for improvement or just something that we like that we want to emulate, at least a piece of. And so on a very practical level, I'm wondering how you've gone about some practical steps that you've taken to not only enable you to make some change, but ultimately to to improve your editing style from your own perspective. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, kind of hearkening back to the original part of our conversation, kind of the, the first thing, two things I did in the same moment was I said, okay, I'm not going to take someone else's hard work personally. I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah. I'm not going to get bothered by it. So that was like re- a really big turning point. No more getting offended. They love what they do. They love their clients. They're doing a good thing. That's them. Be encouraged. Be excited. And then I, the next moment, I, I started studying the images. But then practically for me, I actually started taking those images and collecting them and, and getting on Instagram and Pinterest. And, and I kind of went the other direction. I just started collecting everything I love. And I created a gigantic portfolio of images that I like on a Dropbox folder. I have maybe three to 400 photos that I've looked at over, you know, the last two years or so. Yeah. Yeah, And and I just sit there and I'm like, okay, so what do I like about this? Is it a specific element? Is it everything collectively? What elements do I like? And I'll sit with that image and I'll pick an image from my portfolio that I've taken and I will try to recreate that. So, yeah, so, the, you know, the, the first couple of things, I just stopped taking things personally. I started creating a gigantic collection of work that inspired me. And then I started studying what it looked like, learned about it. I started taking courses and learning all these skills. But then that that fourth thing is like, 
and this is the part, you know, I pulled out, I pulled out that book by Cal Newport called so good. They can't ignore you. Yeah. Yeah. And the biggest point uh, is when in that book, when he sits down and he says, okay, look, like you don't have the skills that you're staring at or that you want or that you desire. You sit down and you create them, you force them to come And in that, that fourth step is you just take a lot of time Uh, or you create time in your schedule regularly and you start practicing your craft. It's like, you know, it's just like playing guitar. It's just like learning how to sing or learning computer coding. It could be anything is you sit down and you diligently, deliberately practice this stuff. You mean it's not just going to happen like automatically. I I feel bad about myself and I keep feeling bad about myself. I'm not going to get better (laughs) as a result. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. How many artists try to tell the story that they wrote a song because they were sad and they became famous? Like, as if, it were, <laughs> as if life were that easy. Right. Like, yeah, sadly, we can't do that as photographers. Gosh, man. Only The Cure did that, hearkening back to like the 90s. <laughs> All right. So th- you said, first of all, don't take someone else's work personally. And, and, and I like that. Yep. I mean, we're setting ego aside. That was number one. Number two, mm-hmm. collecting images for inspiration. Three was mm-hmm. study those images, get a good idea. I mean, it, if I think about this in a practical level, I might look at that portfolio of images that I've collected, I mean, other, other people's work that I'm using as a point of reference and just start making notes about certain things that stick out to me that I really like about them. Mm-hmm. So taking the time to study the images. Number four, was make time to to actually practice the techniques necessary to be able to to kind of implement some of those stylistic techniques mm-hmm. in your images, uh, mm-hmm. and then I think I think you said you had five. What's the fifth one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the kind of the last thing that I've already said before is show up to everything prepared with creative direction. Um, and I, I kind of mentioned it before, but you cannot edit crappy out of a crappy image. Like it's just. you know, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to sound like, you know, this, this person that says the same things over again, but it just, man, there have been years where, like you said earlier in the conversation, I showed up as this amazing photographer with no plan and, and, and I didn't get, didn't get the best images I, I could have. And that's going to directly translate to what comes out in the quality of your editing and what you have to work with. So that's kind of like a general thing about life, but it really complements our conversation. Yeah, creative direction. I think about purpose. I mean, if if you mm-hmm. you talked about the significance of taking a good image to begin with, I think that's important. But when it comes to specifically this talk, topic of editing, you've taken the time to not only research but then develop the editing style. Now that you have that editing style dialed in, going in with purpose, when you go to process those images or ideally even delegate the processing of those images elsewhere, either way, you have purpose. You have a very specific direction that you're going with those images. And if you do so consistently, um, that will translate uh, wonderfully to your to, to the brand, to what people begin to, at least those who are paying attention to the style, that they'll begin to recognize as a reflection of of Nick Brimmer. They'll know, hey, that's, oh, that's how he, that's what his images look like. Part of that's the photographic style. Part of that's the editing style. Um, Clarity and consistency in that direction is important. And um, that's a great way to finish this conversation. This very wide-ranging conversation, by the way, Nick. And and (laughs) I I have to apologize to everybody. I I, I got a little wordy and carried away today in my responses, and I apologize for that. But uh, I I appreciate your willingness to engage in all kinds of conversation and all different types of topics today. (laughs) Oh, Nathan. You know what, Nathan? I will stop and say this. I think you are, first of all, an amazing human being, but I think the reason you are successful in all that you do and and really the reason why I was so happy to hop on and do this is is you just excel at empathy and you are so good at being empathetic and understanding and caring and and you have a skill of agreeableness uh, that is far outside my reach. Um, <laughs> that uh, and so this this has been a blast, man. I, I I know that you will do well, and I hope that your community is super encouraged and, and informed in some way from my scattered conversation. So well, it, that's those are very kind words. I do appreciate it. Empathy is something that I that I've honestly 
struggled with and it's something I'll continue to work at, but I, I do appreciate that encouragement very much. And mm. um, for those of you listening in, I, I, always always feel free to, to give feedback too. Honestly, the purpose of this this podcast, number one, is to add value. We, we I want to make sure that those of you listening in are taking something away that you can go apply to your, and not only your business, but ideally your personal life too, I hope. If nothing else, mm. maybe the, the, the lessons that I'm learning that I'm sharing here and there are helpful to you or those of our guests um, you're able to take those and apply them to your life. I think that's that's really important. Uh, but the other thing too is, I want this this podcast to be a place where you feel like you're able to come for easy, comfortable conversation uh, amongst friends, if you will, for it not to feel so robotic and so kind of static uh, and and dead and contrived. Uh, that there's an opportunity for open, honest conversation. I know we kind of went there today and and some relatively sensitive topics, but I I want this to be a place where everybody can come for that type of conversation. I want there to be room for that and certainly room for multiple opinions. And uh, and, and so, Nick, again, I appreciate you making the time to engage in that style of conversation today and, and kind of going all over with me. And I really appreciate your insight and your wisdom and ultimately your energy as well. And will you just share briefly with our, our listeners one more time where they can find you online, your website and social media? Yeah, absolutely. So my home base is nickbrimmerphotography.com and Instagram, it's nick.brimmer. Facebook, it's Nick Brimmer. I mean, I have my my same photo plastered across all social medias. And I will say specifically, hey, if you're in the Portland or Seattle area, reach out. I would love to hang out, connect with folks. Uh, like I said, I I've just recently re- relocated back, so I would love to create community, maybe do workshops or whatever. It, it would just be a blast. Reach out. That's where I'm at. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nick. We'll put all this information in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. And uh, Nick, thanks so much for making time for our community. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you so much for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com.